going to have a, a roundtable discussion on how could eco-design measures better take innovation into account. We will start this part of the uh, presentations with a short presentation by Evelyn Durio on uh, life and the reason we changed the program to, to include this is that we have found also before but also today uh, the importance of uh, access to capital and, and that's one of the reasons why measures are not taken or, or not really uh, taken that fast as we would like to. So we will start with a short presentation by Ms. Durio and after that we will have <clears throat> an introduction to the roundtable discussion by Edouard Toulouse and, and then we have the roundtable discussion with Mr. Michel Jean Benet from the DG Enterprise, Nils Bidrup from Grundfos, Robert van Baskirk from Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, Hans Nilsson from Forfact and Edward Toulouse from ECOS. So please, Ms. Durio. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So um, I'm Evelyn Durieux, I'm working for the LIFE program. We are the communication team, uh, the service of the European Commission. Uh, as you have heard, I've been requested to give you a quick overview about some uh, EU uh, funding uh, opportunities uh, for, for eco-innovation. Uh, I would like very quickly to highlight the complementarity uh, between EU programs and the fundings. Uh, you probably have heard and we have talked this morning about research and development, which is of huge in, important for eco-design and eco-innovation. That's mainly the job of the seven, so-called seven framework program for research. Uh, the main elements, I don't know if you can see it properly, uh, the main elements from, uh, for the program is that it is about research and development as such. It's a huge budget, as you can see. Uh, it's uh, 53 billion euro for the period 2007-2013, and it covers all the topics uh, of research and development, including environment, material, and so on. There are regular calls for projects, and uh, you can find uh, all information at the, at the database on, of projects on uh, the CORDIS uh, Europa site. Now, then, after the research and development, the next step is a pilot phase, demonstrating the research. Is it feasible as an industrial scale? This is an important question, and that's our business of the, in the LIFE program. That's what we finance. We don't finance the research. We don't finance the market support. We finance the tricky, specific phase of demonstrating and assessing, uh, assessing the technologies and their feasibility at industrial scale. So we have a budget for this period of 1.7 billion for project. And we have a call for project every year. There will be one in, uh, in a few weeks' time, so uh, keep informed <laughs> about, about this. There will be opportunities for funding. Uh, there is a 50, it's a co-funding, like most of, uh, of EU project uh, program, it's co-funding. It's usually 50%. <coughs> And we also have a database of projects, if you would like to see what has been done already in terms of inspiration or gathering and benefiting from the results. We also have a publication, you probably noticed that we have brought a few thematic brochures with us today. After the pilot phase comes the access to market. As we know, it's not very easy to access the market, especially for SMEs. And uh, the, the big competitive and competitiveness and innovation program has a specific section for supporting innovation where the SMEs are a specific target. They are not the only one, but the Commission really focuses on supporting the SMEs going to the market. There are also annual calls for projects. There should be one this year also. So this show you kind of complementarity of these steps, especially, especially for eco-technologies. But you can have other kind of possible EU funding. Uh, I just mentioned this in terms of the cohesion policy with the structural fund and the cohesion fund, where you can find some elements with, on a more general and territorial approach, as well with the rural development policy, where you have the European Agricultural Fund for Rural Development, where technologies for improving uh, agriculture efficiency are possible. 
as well the co for the common fisheries policy there is the european fisher fishery funds especially, especially for the the coastal and fishery area so this gives you a very very quick overview of what is possible uh, if you have questions we are available thank you thank you, thank you very much for, for giving us this presentation at such short notice we will now give a floor to Mr. Edward Toulouse for, from ECOS for a short introductory for, for this roundtable discussion. Thank you. So I'm Edward Toulouse from ECOS. ECOS is an umbrella organization representing environmental NGOs in the discussion of these uh, eco-design and energy labeling policies. So at this point, at this time of the day, I will somehow summarize several of the issues and concepts that have been presented today. Uh, I'll provide a few additional examples and then I'll introduce uh, some of the recommendations that are floating around when it comes to these aspects of innovation in eco-design policies and that could serve as a basis for the panel discussion. So first uh, I'd like to start uh, by uh, uh, reminding that indeed these innovation aspects are important and key when we discuss eco-design and labeling measures, but very often they are not used in uh, such a positive way that we've heard today. Uh, when we're trying to advocate for uh, ambitious for minimum per energy performance requirements, what we can hear is sometimes, wow, this proposal will seriously hinder innovation, it will cripple innovation, the proposals would prohibit the possibility to introduce new technologies on the market, etc. So I'm a bit provocative here because these quotes have been taken out of, of their context, but this is real quotes that uh, exist in industry papers. So now if we uh, look at a different perspective, this evaluation study on the Eco-Design Directive that has been completed last year, there are a few paragraphs about innovation. And basically they say that there is, seems to be rather a positive, even though in, in direct role, for the directive in the development of innovation. Indirect, because uh, promoting innovation might not be the primary goal of these policies, but still it provides a good level playing field for the development of innovation. Uh, in some cases, the uh, eco-design measures on some product groups uh, have had a challenging role and led to the adoption of existing or new technologies. That's the positive examples we've heard this morning, for example, for circulators, lightning, However, in some other cases, opportunities have been missed. And uh, I want to focus on this now by uh, providing a couple of examples and trying to understand why, in some cases, we have not been able to really anticipate innovation. So, TVs. Ah, TVs again, of course. We found a lot about televisions today and everywhere, and uh, uh, that's a, a very interesting case study. Um, so it's worth going a bit deeper into it. So this graph just uh, summarizes the uh, situation. The eco-design uh, limits on energy consumption that were planned for 2010-2012 that are represented by the horizontal dotted lines. Um, can be compared against the average efficiency of the TV sets put on the market. And we see that there's been a steady decrease in energy consumption that makes these 2010 and 2012 uh, requirements uh, quite obsolete. They've had practically no impact on the market because the efficiency had already uh, been increased. Another way of looking at this picture is by uh, having uh, uh, an insight into the energy label for TVs that has been adopted at the same time as the eco-design uh, requirements. So basically, this uh, energy label for TVs started with an A to G uh, uh, scale on the left, and then uh, additional classes are supposed to be added in the background, uh, A plus, A double plus, A triple plus, with the timing that is in indicated uh, below. Um, last week, in a shop, in a retail shop here in Brussels, I've seen uh, 
a TV screen that qualifies for the A triple plus already. Um, okay, that's a giant monster of 75 inch. So if after this workshop you want to rush to go and buy it, you'll have to pay the price, I can tell you. <laughs> However, uh, when you compare this against the timing that was uh, um, here uh, um, planned for this, the A triple plus class was supposed to be fit for 2020, and now it's supposed to be there already seven to eight years in advance. So obviously there's been a very uh, bad uh, anticipation of innovation here. I'll be completely fair because I see that there are TV industry people in the room and uh, they like to remind that if you look at uh, the blue bars that show indeed the decrease in energy consumption of, for example, a 40 inch TV, uh, it's very small, but it's the years, 2009, 9 to 2012. Okay, there's indeed a path that comes from faster innovation, for example, uh, switching to LED TVs, better filters, and so on. There's also a substantial path that comes from the fact that the testing conditions have been changed. So now the TVs are, are uh, tested in home mode with a lower luminance level. So that explains also why the declared energy consumption could, could be lower. However, there's still this uh, innovation aspect. Similar prob uh, probable underestimation of innovation. Now I'll move to uh, an eco-design measure that has not been adopted yet. So I'm doing a little bit of advocacy from the side. Shh, don't repeat it. Um, it's for computers and it's about to be voted. This measure uh, um, included, includes some uh, power allowances for the use of graphic cards. So that means it's a sort of bonus that helps manufacturers to comply with the uh, minimum requirements. Uh, you have different uh, uh, types of graphic card from G1 to G7. The G7 is the most powerful uh, graphic card. The blue um, bars show you uh, the actual proposal for the uh, power allowances that would be given to manufacturers. Um, in the US, there's been some testing of graphic cards from CLASP and, and uh, US Environmental NGO. The red bars show the, the test results from uh, graphic cards put on the market in 2011 and the green ones, uh, uh, products from 2012. This shows that obviously there's been a huge progress in the performance of these cards. And in fact, if these blue allowances are maintained like this, there would be uh, much too high, and that would be f really free bonuses given to manufacturers that would make the whole thing quite ineffective. Another one, uh, uh, we could go for hours, but underestimation of power scalability technologies. So what does this ugly word mean, power scalability? It's just the fact that some microprocessors are able to adjust the power they use to the function that they are doing. It sounds like a no-brainer that a product should adjust its consumption to the load, to the function, but it's uh, not done everywhere, but there's a lot of innovati innovative technologies to do that. So for example, game consoles. The game console industry has recently proposed to uh, go for a voluntary initiative to reduce their energy consumption in order to avoid an eco-design regulation. And they've said, okay, we won't set any target for the gaming mode of, of game console because we don't want to constrain our gaming creativity, but we are ready to set some power limits to secondary modes like playing a video or navigating in the menus and so on. So here is the example of playing a video. On the left, the green bars shows you what a uh, standalone uh, video player consumes. It's quite small because it's a simple product. Then the orange bar shows you what a current uh, um, game console consumes to play a video. Why is it so much higher? It's because when the console plays the video, a lot of other functions are switched on and ready to use. The gray bar is what the industry uh, proposes. So they say, okay, we commit by 2017 to consume the same amount of power. 
nice, but at the same time, the last bar, the green one, shows that in the, for example, gaming laptop uh, sector, they've already introduced some power scalability. They have some technologies that can reduce the power used. So why wouldn't the game console industry do the same? So maybe now you would say, okay, it's only uh, give, providing examples in the uh, electronics area. So maybe it's just an issue with the electronics. It's quite specific. So I've tried to find another example in a more traditional sector. So I went for tumble dryers. Tumble dryers are an interesting case because there are some uh, conventional dryers on the market and there, there's been some innovation with the heat pump dryers. But they are, uh, okay, they are known to be uh, more expensive. So here, look at the first two bars. So the first one is uh, uh, the price of a conventional uh, condenser dryer today. The second bar is the price uh, uh, that was estimated when the co-design measure for uh, dryers were, was discussed for a heat pump dryer. And of course, you see a huge difference in price. Uh, so obviously, the EU decision makers said, we cannot, for example, um, set a target for the co-design requ requirement at the level of heat pump dryers because uh, there would be an affordability issue. And then I went a bit on the internet yesterday to try to find if there were some cheaper uh, heat pump dryer, and I managed to find one, an A triple plus uh, model that actually is around 400 euros. Okay, it was on a UK uh, e-shop website, and we know that in the UK they can be quite aggressive on uh, appliance prices. But still, it changes the picture drastically because if it's now only a matter of a difference uh, of 100 euros, then you can reconsider, uh, shouldn't we go for this technology uh, uh, and more innovative ones. So I'm done with the examples and uh, now I will focus on the main lessons learned uh, from uh, five years of implementing these uh, policies. I see two essential causes for these missed opportunities and underestimation of, of innovation aspects. In the electronic sector, it's probably that uh, technological innovation goes fast, and there's also power management innovation that goes fast. For example, this power scalability is one example. And in the appliance sector, it's mostly an issue of uh, a wrong estimation of the costs and prices for innovation. That's been said already today. There are a lot of long track records in the US that the costs and prices go down um, faster than we could imagine. Quality of data is, of course, a, a key, key condition for success. If you don't have good data to make engineering uh, estimation and so on, or good market data, um, you would probably have ineffective uh, eco-design measures. And also, as we've seen for TVs, what is measured and how it is measured matters. But uh, at the end of the day, these innovation dynamics and innovation aspects uh, remain understudied. I think that could be also a key conclusion from this workshop, that uh, in all the discussions that we've wi witnessed, there's a lot of uh, preparatory studies, impact assessment studies that looked at, uh, at technology forecast, but they are rather theoretical. There's no post ante evaluation from the field of what really happened, how uh, technology, how innovation has been picked up. Now, my two last slides will focus on the, some of the recommendations that are floating around, and I will confront that to what's actually happening at EU level. So I take you back again uh, to this evaluation study on the Eco-Design Directive, and uh, let's look at the recommendations. First, what they say is the introduction of longer-term requirements could be desirable, so setting a longer-term target to the industry so they really know in which uh, framework they are competing and we can also potentially be more ambitious to give them a, a, a very clear challenge. The benchmark that have not played a very strong role so far in eco-design measures could be used for these long-term requirements. Leaf cycle, leaf life cycle cost criteria has been discussed already this afternoon, but we could go, could be a bit more ambitious and go for equal life cycle costs has been said. So identical, uh, uh, life cycle costs for the consumer. 
Also, an ID that has not been uh, uh, discussed yet is uh, requirements could be ma made more, more dynamic by being tied to market development. So you could say, for example, once a certain uh, a number of models reach a certain uh, uh, efficiency, then we uh, implement the next level of requirements. Or once the price of uh, the average price of a certain technology goes down by a certain um, uh, level, then we can uh, set the next year. Of course, to do that, you need good market data, which we don't have in the EU, unfortunately. So what's the EU doing? Um, We've heard recently that uh, the European Commission considers setting more stringent requirements for a longer term period. This has been experienced a little bit, more or less. So BAT means best available technologies. That could be the third tier, so it's a bit like a top runner approach. The Commission understands that reviewing and revising all these co-design measures must be done in a very dynamic way, so they could use some sort of fast track, although we don't know what it means. They've issued a tender to start a rather limited market monitoring exercise that should bring more systematic data to evaluate where we stand in terms of uh, up, uh, uptake of, of innovative technologies. Uh, regarding learning curves that have been uh, mentioned today, unfortunately, there's only one paragraph that I could find, uh, find that refers to learning curves you see, in the revised eco-design methodology that is used for the preparatory studies. And it just says that, yeah, potentially learning curves could be used, but there's no methodology, there's no procedure to do that. And I think we can thank CLASP here because it's because they've uh, produced a, a position paper that it ended up in this revised methodology. And in terms of market condi condition requirements, I think it's been used only once, uh, for what I know, in the recently adopted uh, measure for directional lighting. Somewhere it says that the, the most ambitious tier will only enter into force if it's proven that pro affordable tr products are available on the market and the European Commission should follow up to make sure that th th this can be tracked. But will they do that really? Uh, that's another question. So thanks for that. Thank you very much, Edward. Uh, we are now opening up to, to a debate and discussion here. And I think your presentation led us back to, to Peter's uh, in, introduction this morning that there is a need of political leadership and uh, I was uh, wondering if you would like to comment on how we can reduce the risks for our political leaders and, and what uh, innovation plays, what role innovation plays when we are going to, to reduce that risk so we can get a much deeper implementation and, and deployment of, of the energy efficient technology. So. Um, Maybe EU, Michel Jon would like to start? Okay. Yeah, well, I think, uh, first of all, today has been a very interesting day for me attending from, from this morning. And thank, thank you to, um, to the Swedish Energy Agency, CLASP, um, uh, and everybody who EC Tripoli, who's been involved in, uh, in, in getting this day together. And it's very interesting for us as policy makers to see uh, the world outside with, uh, uh, without being involved in the individual lots, as, as it's called, for each product group. Um, I think uh, there's, there's been some um, important points raised. One of my uh, big issues from being outside uh, the Commission and only just joining for a year would seem to be, um, despite all the the nice equations we might put up on, on these boards and in our discussions and, and all the fantastic stakeholder consultations that we have where many industry people, uh, many NGOs, many uh, uh, trade associations take the time to talk to us. Uh, one thing I find from both being inside the Commission and outside that's very frustrating is market surveillance. And maybe many people here might share that concern. It's, it's a thorny issue that's difficult to do much about because we create these nice edifices of layer upon layer of regulations and different demands. 
And then it seems to me, especially coming from DG Enterprise, that um, those companies that have taken the trouble, either because they see it as competitive advantage or just because they want to be good citizens with a strong CSR or sustainability agenda within their company, they go ahead, they're proactive, they aim for A triple plus or whatever we might call it, and then the market surveillance does not back up their greener technologies so that they may make these uh, strides ahead, make that investment, and their investment isn't protected. So I haven't got a quick and dirty or even a quick and sophisticated solution that I could offer anybody here today, but I would certainly welcome, and I think DG Enterprise would welcome uh, more contributions on that. Of course, the thing is that it's not a commission um, uh, we don't have the competence to enforce market surveillance directly. It's for the member states. Um, I think another, so. That's in terms of a, an overview on where the political will might come from and the big messages. One thing that we always stress to our cabinet is we must support the greener industries as well as the conventional industries, as well as the laggards. So we have to have the so-called leaders and laggards. But everybody needs that certainty. I think that their market surveillance will be adequately performed. Um, I think innovation, one nice buzz phrase that one of my colleagues gave to me when I was talking about this, but I think it's come out of some of today's discussions, is that innovation is uh, an amplifier of market transformation. So we have these market transformation initiatives. Whether the chicken is before the egg or the egg before the chicken, sometimes it's, it's difficult to tell. Um, I think a key issue that Edward has just raised in his presentation that, that we should all take on board is uh, information provision. And we've seen in a few uh, of the presentations today uh, the notions of asymmetric information uh, holding and asymmetric information provision. And so it's sometimes very hard for us as uh, maybe in comparison, not, not to to, to ask for too many excuses and, and to, to ask for your pity as poor commission policy officers, but we only have one of us compared to, I think, about 10 of our US colleagues, and we have to move these mountains uh, uh, that uh, our US colleagues can do a bit more in, in a team. But if we can't get hold of, of good information and, and timely information, it's, it, is also, it is therefore, by definition, difficult for us to do these crystal ball gazing uh, for three to five years, uh, simply because we, we don't even have the full information today. And don't forget that we have, we've had these um, presentations and uh, a number of people involved in the consultation forum have made, the different consultation fora for eco-design, have made these very um, cogent, very um, uh, appropriate statements. That, that every eco-design lot takes already maybe five years to get to market, as it were. So we're trying to predict maybe five years ahead or, or, or eight or maybe ten years now if we have three-tiered uh, legislation. But we're doing that from a period five years before. So then we've got the total time lag is between uh, ten and fifteen years, maybe. Possibly related to that as well is what is the role of trade associations? Do trade associations, and, and I speak as someone who used to work for two trade associations here in, in Brussels previously. My impression sometimes is that trade associations, with their amalgamation of industry members, may promote not necessarily a so called race to the bottom, but a race to the mediocre. Because their best members cannot stride ahead without the permission of the overall trade association. That's a bit of a personal remark, maybe, but uh, rather than a total commission remark, but it's, it's maybe at the nub of some of the Brussels decision-making. Mm -hmm. So uh, without uh, uh, endlessly going on, I thought maybe those three points, mm -hmm. are they uh, a good starter? Absolutely, absolutely. Yes, Niels. Yes, I, I would like to start to comment on uh, on the uh, market surveillance from our industry, that is one of the biggest concern now. We have the legislation in place since the uh, 1st of January here for circulators. Can it be, uh, will the monitoring and market surveillance be uh, 
sufficient. And actually, with seven years of a voluntary agreement with AGG labeling, we, we have learned how to survey ourselves. So actually, we are in a position where we will actually pick up uh, breaches of this law in, in every corner of the of EU. That will not be the problem. We have learned that because we have had uh, uh, monitored ourselves for, for seven years and, and actually found out in, in different corners of Europe where, where they didn't follow our industry commitment. Mm. But we don't know what to do with our knowledge. Uh, so we would like and would welcome a process also uh, uh, how to handle uh, 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 when we find out that in some country in Europe that, uh, that there is a non-compliant product and also to Brussels to send a signal that they can actually do uh, do something uh, mm. with, with that uh, information. Mm. Edward? Yeah. To reply maybe to your question about how to uh, reduce the risk for mm. uh, policy makers, uh, I think there are two, two ways. The first one is to learn from the past. Uh, there's probably also a political learning curve that we could apply because now we have some experience uh, in setting these uh, eco-design measures and very rarely the requirements have been too ambitious. Uh, mm -hmm. on, the, on the contrary, in several cases they have been not ambitious enough. So I think policy makers should start really considering this and, and being bolder. Uh, they can be, there, there might be exceptions, but overall it really seems that they can be more aggressive. And the other way, if they are really uh, worried about what could happen if they make, make it wrong, then uh, again, they should have better uh, tools for tracking and evaluating what they do. So if we had a better picture of how the market evolves, of the, 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 the sales of the different types of products and efficiency levels, then they would be able uh, to track any uh, difficulty and uh, that would make their life easier as well. So it's really strange and a shame that the EU has not set up such a mechanism that would really um, ease the life of every, everybody. Well, lack of evaluation is, is a problem I think many of us know and, and have met at several places. And I, I've been working a lot with evaluating energy policies during my career. And I, I was a bit upset about the lack of, of evaluation of energy policies, but then just say five or six years ago, I, I learned that it's not only energy policy we don't evaluate, it's policy as a whole. We have a very large gap of not evaluating the policies we are including in the society. And, and I think that's a, a major issue if we're going to be able to allo allocate the money correctly. And Hans just wanted, an, and then Robert. I would like to return to what we heard in the presentation from Mr. Toulouse and also from you here um, and say that, first of all, when we are trying to figure out what, how, what in innovation can do, we had to see that there's a difference between industry and company. Mm. And the industry as an association or a group of companies, they may be raising to at least paralysis. They, they prefer that uh, nothing should happen. They have good control over the situation. Uh, whereas for the companies, uh, for companies, innovation is natural, and as I said this morning, it's a natural uh, activity that goes on. And we have heard perfect examples of it from Grundfos, for instance, and I had an example from Electrolux showing that companies may choose to be in the forefront in pole position or be leaders, to be seen to be leaders. So I think that, first of all, we have to be absolutely sure that industry is one thing and companies is the other. And if we really want innovation to go, we should try to adopt a, a tactic of divide and rule to make sure that the companies feel that it is worthwhile to be challenged, it's worthwhile to do something, it's worthwhile to take this pole position. Um, and uh, just since very much of my background is a technology procurement, I remember that at least in one case when we had a technology procurement, we gathered the entire industry. In, in the room in Sweden and talked about what we would like to do. Uh, this is our idea, this is our plan, what do you think? And you could imagine what they thought. They say, please leave us alone, we, we know this. Why are you fussing around on our turf? In the end, when the procurement was made, the same guys came back and said, can we do it again? When, when can we try make another try? 
So my point is, is it, this to me shows that when the group is acting as a group, and yeah. as we all are doing, say, we feel challenged, we don't like it to be challenged as a group, but as a company, as an individual, I can think, this is fun. Yeah. And this is what we have to learn to get innovations yeah. going. So is it neglect? Is it uh, risk avoidance? Or what is it? You can think of it while uh, Robert is... Uh... Yeah, so... <coughs> I can uh, maybe share s some of the experiences that have been seen over the past uh, a few years on different aspects that were addressed by the EC. Um, I'll, I'll first go over some of the market surveillance uh, issues. Uh, there's, there's maybe two or three different types of market surveillance. Uh, I think one of the key issues is enforcement, right? Um, it, it, the, the U.S. recent efforts began a few years ago. The enforcement process began by promulgating a, 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 a set of announcements and regulations that, tied up, that tightened up the product certification process. By tightening up the product certification process and centralizing it, then uh, what happened is uh, non-compliant products that were put onto the market would first be assessed by whether or not they had gone through the proper certification procedures. So then when the lawyers approached the companies, uh, that would be the first thing. Then once the products are in the certification database, so there, there were centralized procedures set up where to have the product on the market, they had to enter through a web interface the, the certification information on the products. There were the procedures. And then once, once, once there's the database of products, then um, one can start going through a random sampling or complaint-based methods to start evaluating some of the products on the database. When, when you start evaluating those products in the database, then you find a certain uh, non-compliance rate, um, you know, five, ten percent for randomly sampled. I think you hear Australia, uh, they do complaint-based, and so given that they're complaints, it's thirty percent or something. So, so, but those numbers are just not, not re really specific. Um, so then, so then that sets up, so in the, in, in our process, in the U.S. process, it's, it's sort of a fraction of the budget, say, say a reasonable fraction of the budget on something like that, because, because compliance issues may, may deal with a, a five or ten percent margin on the energy use, like a five or ten percent allocation of the budget is sort of a reasonable type of type of allocation for that type of thing. Then in addition, uh, there's, there, there's a little bit of an effort to develop new and cheaper methods for monitoring the prices and the distribution of efficiencies in the market. Some of that is done by uh, uh, purchasing data sets from private providers. In the European market, it's GFK. In, in the U.S. market, there's, there's a firm called NPD. Uh, per product for five years or something like that, you can sometimes purchase data for twenty, thirty thousand uh, dollars a piece. In addition, the other methods that are available is that uh, the computer programmers can can write things that are called web crawlers. What the web web crawlers or web spiders, and what the web spiders do is they survey the the internet retail uh, websites and collect periodically data from those 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 retail offers in order to get to get distributions of products, efficiency, performance, and prices. Um, a third method is that there is a, a, an active internet commerce industry. Uh, that internet commerce industry has, has within it uh, a, a, a way, uh, different data feeds for providing product offers. And so, and so a third method is developing partnerships with, the, with internet commerce providers 
who can provide potentially uh, 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 databases of price and, and, and product information. Uh, in, in addition, uh, you know, the U.S., like any jurisdiction, um, uh, is, is, is concerned with the monitoring and verification. So on the monitoring and verification, there's, there's the whole issue of the field performance, too. We're trying to figure out how to, how to increase our levels of, of actual field performance of the data, which, would, which might be a shortcut method of verifying the, the efficiency performance. Um, we do that either by having people go out and there's, there's, you can get power cords that log the data second by second for, for an appliance that's plugged in. Uh, we send people out to, to plug in appliances into these power cords and, and to monitor the energy use of TVs or, or, or refrigerators. In addition, uh, we, 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 we're trying things like uh, doing statistical analysis of the advanced metering data. And so the advanced metering data provides household energy use by, uh, on an hourly basis. If you actually know the date in which someone changes their TV or buys, buys a new TV or changes out their, their, their uh, refrigerator, you can get a t post time period of when they changed the appliance, a pre time period of when they changed the appliance. And if it's pretty much just the appliance change and you control for the, the, the behavior change, you can do some statistics to come up with a verification of a change of, of, of energy use utilizing the advanced meter data. To make it easier to provide access, to, to get access or automate access to advanced metering data, one of the initiatives of the U.S. government is something called the Green Button Initiative. What the Green Button Initiative does is it provides a standardized format for outputting copies of the hourly advanced meter data. And then by getting the utilities to agree to provide a green button output of the advanced meters, there becomes a standardized method of outputting utility or energy use data that is consistent across utilities, right? So this data standardization provides uh, greater access for the information. Uh, in addition, sort of the standardization tactic uh, also is promoted by uh, an international cooperation initiative uh, 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 supported by, you know, um, uh, all of the countries participating in the clean energy ministerial. So there's an initiative called the Super Efficient Appliance Deployment Initiative. Uh, under that initiative, realizing the the uh, needs to, you know, enable surveilling of markets and surveilling of products. Uh, uh, that initiative is, is starting the first very tentative steps at uh, trying to come up with a standardized format for sharing the product certification data so that um, you know, certification databases in Australia or the US or Canada or Europe could be shared and then that would help provide an element of global market surveillance mm -hmm. and uh, with the idea that if efficient products can get mar marketed not only to the European market or the US market but to the global market, then that increased market for the most efficient products would provide increased investment recovery and would provide accelerated innovation through that global uh, market scaling. And uh, the Super Efficient Appliances Deployment Initiative, uh, which is an intergovernmental cooperation, is, is trying to promote some of those types of um, activities in coordination with the 4, 4 e, IEA 4E initiative and, 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 and collaborators. So those are a 
series Thank you. of things that Thank hopefully uh, share some of that yeah. experience. Thank you. Uh, I would like also to come back to one of the things that several of you have been touching on, and, and that's the SMEs. To what uh, extent is uh, eco-design and innovation uh, uh, an obstacle to SMEs, and to what extent is it um, actually the way they are going to be able to, to, to survive? And uh, I was thinking of it when you were, Nils, when you were talking about the, the circulators, and, and also when Edward was talking. So. Yes, I, I can start with uh, circulators. What we have seen, and we, we already saw that with the HUD label, but especially here with the mandatory requirement, is that we have seen new players on the market which actually see this as an opportunity, that they have a chance to get into the market with a new product, high efficiency product. We have also seen uh, alliances, we have seen uh, sources of components. So, as, as I said, we have a strong competitive market consisting of small and uh, medium uh, enterprises, size in enterprises also. So uh, this has created a, a, a basis for, for them and have, mm -hmm. have not at all uh, had any detrimental effect on, on their uh, um, yeah, opportunities on the market. Edward, do, do you have any comments on specific on SMEs, on, on if it's innovation is a method or, or a threat for them to, to survive? Well, maybe two, two answers. First, in the, uh, in the policy process, how these uh, regulations are set, it's clear that it's more difficult for SMEs to participate, to have a say about what's happening, because it's time consuming to follow the different drafts, to make comments, and so on. So um, it's an issue, and everything needs to be done so that their voice can be heard. Uh, now, when it comes to innovation, I don't think uh, we can be really specific because in some cases, um, of course, if you need uh, to be innovative uh, and have a lot of capital uh, and investment, then it can favor the biggest companies. And in other sectors, for example, lighting, uh, we see that with the development of LEDs that a lot of small firms have been created going directly for LED products, like the one we've heard this morning. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's rather favorable for uh, startups and, and small companies. Mm -hmm. So it really depends on how these SMEs are promoted in the first mm -hmm. place and how innovation is structured in the different mm -hmm. countries. Okay, and Robert? Yeah, I think um, uh, a lot of what we see is that with, when the overall market is accelerating its innovation rate, then you get uh, the appearance of the startup type of SMEs. Mm -hmm. But then there's other SMEs which are more stable mom and pop businesses. Mm -hmm. and, and, and those those will be some of the companies sort of put at disadvantage. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the, 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 the US also has special SME funding programs and, and has a set of SMEs that, that are doing that. But, but, but for the startup ones, they, they then go to the venture capitalists. You know, they have a good idea, they push it for a while, and then they go yeah. to the venture okay. capitalists yeah. because they can maybe compete with the big guys for, 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 a, bit, for a better pump. Hans, you. Well, first of all, about these SMEs. Uh, if you consider what the learning curve looks like and, and what is ex one of the explanations behind the learning curve is that when the market grows, uh, it will attract more innovations and it will attract more companies who have better ideas or they see an opportunity. And some of them will be SMEs, of course. So I don't think there's a threat to an SME and I don't think there's a threat to the big player either because the market is growing. If we were talking about the static and, and constant market, then you could start to talk in, in terms of threat. But uh, given the situation that the energy efficiency of the market is enormous, I don't see anything about threat. To the contrary. Um, and uh, uh, then w when Robert mentioned the green button, it came to my mind again that if we go back to the types of innovation that I, I mentioned this morning, that business models is one of the innovations. And we see a, a market where, for instance, the energy supplier could have a new role that they didn't have in, in the old days. Uh, that might be something for eco-innovation to think about. Say, so, so what will the market develop 
uh, into when these new players come in and there could be new combination of players, new actors on the market, including uh, energy, uh, energy suppliers, including uh, combinations of, of uh, companies from different sectors, from different branches. And I think that if, if eco innovation uh, or uh, the, the echo uh, start to, to uh, think in terms of what this would mean. For instance, Green Button. And Green Button, yes, it's, it's organized in the United States, but there are similar initiatives in other countries. So. <coughs> Michel Lyon, do you have any comments on the SME <coughs> questions? Yeah, I think one, one thing to say is that SMEs is extremely important, an extremely important uh, sector I mean, let's face it, it's, it's, it's the most important sector for Europe and, and Europe getting out of uh, recession. Uh, but in particular, for eco-design, uh, we always have to do a so-called SME test in the impact assessment stage. So this is once the draft uh, regulation or voluntary instrument may, may be in the air. Uh, we then have to do a, a, a test as part of the impact assessment procedure to see how such a measure uh, or, or uh, a range of possible options may affect SMEs positively and negatively. And then I was talking in one of the breaks to, to one of the attendees here who uh, was, was mentioning the very important point uh, of the role of member states, again, to say those at member states which are more active in consultation fora, it seems that they take the trouble to also hold briefings, breakfasts, events such as today in their own countries to brief companies who may not be aware of what's going on in Brussels. And many of those companies who face the information gap are probably SMEs. We are we're aware that many of those who attend consultation fora for the various eco-design lots the SMEs is, is a voice that's, that's frequently missed out unless there happens to be a trade association for those SMEs here in Brussels. And even then, that trade association may be a, a so-called one-man band who has to try to represent, say, 10,000 members. And so we're aware that that's uh, it's an issue. Yeah. And just a small addition, but if I was launching tomorrow uh, a startup or an SME, maybe I'll do one day, but probably I will not try to uh, uh, go and compete with the big players. Uh, I will not try to put a TV set on the market, but probably what I would try to do is to uh, produce a component that increases the energy efficiency of the TV if I have a patent or something. And that's something we've not really discussed today, but the, uh, it's also important to look at the innovation aspects from the component mm. providers. And again, the, probably the television is a uh, good case study and to see how they, because a TV manufacturer is mostly picking up some components from here and there and how in this industry the innovation can be stimulated is uh, really interesting. That's a, a very important remark. Do we have any questions from the floor? Yes, there's one. My name is Elinor Krups. I'm working for uh, the Association of uh, Swedish Engineering Companies. And I would like to take the chance to comment on our role as an industry organization. Uh, I'm just talking for companies as Electrolux, Ericsson, SKF, Volvo, heat exchanger companies, and, and so on. And um, I would say a word about uh, eco-design and um, legislation. And what I think is very important is that legislation are uh, being predictable, are in having long time that we can see it for, for uh, demand, demanding requirements on, on long time, but international harmonized. So, and that is one, one part, but the other part that would be the market surveillance, market surveillance as was mentioned. And of course, that is very much important for the companies being the drivers, since the drivers are the first companies putting the new technology on the market. Um, as an industry organization, I would like to tell you about how we are working. We are really trying to analyze the situation and come together to the authorities and legislators with proposals. We think that it's very important. I will 
come to you later with two reports that we have been doing the latest years. One about market surveillance and collaboration, which is, is a report that we try to see on a pan-European level how to better increase and uh, implement market surveillance uh, in different areas. And the, the other report we put a lot of efforts in is how to create more effective legislation regarding eco-design. So we, we as an industry organization are trying to be very proactive in our fields. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We have another question in the back. Um, I have a question on the uh, amount of time it uh, takes to come to an eco-design. Um, this morning, if I understood it correctly, it was about 55 or 58 months, something like that. And this afternoon we hear that uh, the predictability in areas that are driven by solid state physics or solid state manufacturing is poor. Um, I see a connection between the two. It's impossible to predict what's happening in such a dynamic environment where product life cycles are even, they're expressed in quarters actually. Two quarters, three quarters, maximum product life time. So my feedback would be if you want to improve on the, let's say, the, um, the enforcement uh, strengths of eco-design, then the first thing to do would be to uh, reduce that throughput time, big time, like at least slice it by two or three, a factor of two or three, and then you are in a position to actually react on what's happening in the market, use that feedback, and then it will be re recognized as a force to, uh, to deal with. Yes, and, and that really leads to a question on what, what products should be included in the eco-design. When are the policy makers faster than the market, or when is, when is the market faster than the policy makers? <laughs> so maybe um, um, we could have some comments. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting point, and it's one that we're well aware of. But of course, there are different products and different product groups. So I myself am responsible uh, just, just for everyone's information because this, this doesn't appear to be very evident sometimes. The way that we've carved up uh, the eco-design lots between DG Enterprise and DG Energy is that in general DG Enterprise takes the B2B, the business to business um, lots. Uh, so that's in my case furnaces, industrial furnaces, machine tools. We also do transformers. Um, and then things like uh, commercial, uh, industrial refrigeration or ventilation, etc. Uh, and then the, the more business to consumer traditional uh, goods that we've seen some analyses of today, that's generally DG energy. So then if we look at, say, uh, something like TVs or light bulbs, which have uh, both their very positive points, I think, and, and the negative sides that we've seen, um, we have a much bigger wealth of experience in DG Energy on, on those products, but they tend to be, especially when they're electronic products, much quicker in terms of um, the innovation timeline, or at least what we've seen historically up until now, uh, and especially in recent years. Whether that's been partly provoked by eco-design as a threat, in inverted commas, is, uh, is an interesting question. Maybe it seems in the TVs, the eco-design measures per se, once they came out, didn't. Then if you take a, 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 some of the, the intermediate um, timelines, you've got the, the boilers. So people generally uh, renew their boiler possibly every 10 years. And the, the way in which the boilers or the heaters, space heaters, uh, have progressed, they don't progress typically as quickly uh, in terms of innovation as, as electronics products. Then we've got the, the, the products that I'm dealing with now, at least the, the furnaces, they typically, once they're installed, they're there for 30 years, some of them. Some of them maybe 10 years, depending on the sector. So we have to take those things into account. Some of the sectors can't move as quickly as others or have not traditionally been able or, or haven't been used to moving as quickly and maybe technically and market-wise cannot. I think a, a related point that's interesting, and which we could, we could think about with the boilers or the space heaters and the TVs, is uh, maybe the threat or the uh, uh, awareness that, that an eco-design measure was coming, whether it be a voluntary instrument or normally uh, regulation, 
already has that uh, element of pushing the marketplace in that the industry actors start to get ready. And I think that's a fair enough. It's a bit of an intangible uh, conclusion to draw, but maybe those, who, those present who had experience of many a consultation forum might say that even the fact that once a, once a product goes onto the working plan that uh, has been discussed this morning by uh, my colleague from DG Energy, once product is on that working plan, then alarm bells start to ring and people get together and there's movement. Uh, and that's no mean feat of eco-design and maybe some of the uh, jumps, the technological leaps have already occurred during the five-year preparation process, which, as DG Energy said, they may be able to cut by one year, but for the more complex product groups, I think it would be too adventurous to, to try to cut them. I think for furnaces, for example, that may be, uh, we may need to have uh, two consultation fora. I'm not saying that as an official uh, policy point today, <laughs> uh, but it's the kind of uh, more complex product group where for everyone's sake, maybe one consultation forum may indeed not be enough. So that we have the first consultation forum, which is, is everyone happy in the direction that the, that the measure is going? And the second one is, right, now we're on the details. I'm not saying that's going to happen, but it's uh, with these more complex product groups, they cannot be uh, fast-tracked, uh, potentially. Okay. Yes? I, I want to sort of put out an idea for potentially addressing some of the, some of the issues of the market moving sort of faster than the regulation. <coughs> and I think one of the key things that happens is that the, 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 in some sense, the regulation is done as steps. But we actually know that, 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 that the market sort of moves at a rate. So, so even, though, even though the regulations for refrigerators in the U.S. have been done as steps, if you go back to 1977 <laughs> and look at the, the, the trend in energy use, it has decreased at the rate of about 3 to 4 percent per year. So, so what would happen if, if we said, look, we're going to do a consultation, and the consultation sets a rate, and let's try the first rate of 3% per year, so any steps will at be at default that rate, and then at the next consultation, we'll check to see whether the rate is fast enough. And so that, so that your rate is your first approximation of how fast the market is moving, and then and then you're deviating from a line rather than deviating from a, from a flat step that you know is not quite right. Yeah. Interesting. Edward? Yeah. Once I've made a calculation um, to compare uh, the time by which uh, um, substantial eco-design requirements enter into force, usually it's the second tier because the first one is usually not very ambitious. So. Uh, the date of entry into force compared to the data upon which the preparatory study for this product group uh, uh, was used and um, was based. And uh, it can be eight years, nine years, sometimes 10 years. Of course, it's too extreme. Huh? Mm -hmm. it's, uh, uh, there, there are other process in between. There's the impact assessment. But basically, it shows that uh, it's nearly a decade um, um, between what the first data we have and the uh, entry into force. So in a decade, a lot can happen. And uh, pr probably that's the reason why a lot of innovation has not been anticipated. Mm. Now, an interesting question could be, uh, is it sufficient that the EU starts discussing this measure to move the industry? Mm. And uh, OK, I can't answer. Should be some industry representatives telling us. but. It might be that sometimes uh, the fact that there is a, a regulation in preparation and if there is some idea of the target already, the first movers move already. And that would be interesting to analyze because it could also explain that by the time the requirements enter into force, in fact, they are quite obsolete because the market has moved already. 
Um, that could yeah. be a more yeah, positive so the threat side. of a regulation would be a, a driver in that sense. Um, yeah. Just a comment to uh, that uh, that uh, industry uh, move faster than the legislation. We we also had to look about the, the time. We are talking about the date of adoption, but uh, for example, for circulators, that was in 2009. But we had a, a pretty good idea, at least half a year, because that that was after the regulatory committee. There is a, a period also there before it's adopted, and there there is a half a year before where we know from position paper where is it actually roughly going to end. So 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 that means that uh, even a year before adoption, industry had a, an idea of where we're going, and a year before that or two years, we are in, in a preparatory study. We know that something is going to happen. And then after the adoption, we get two, three years. So that is one of the reasons that when, the, when it comes into force, the, the requirements we have had uh, several years actually to react on it. Mm. Yes. We had a question at the end, at, at the back, sorry. Hello. First, I um, want to say thank you. This is an excellent day and very stimulating. And I've always learned a lot from my friends in Sweden and from the whole process uh, of consultations here. I'm, my name is Catherine Conway, and right now I'm working with the United Nations Environment Program. Um, so I, I want to ask a question. I'll answer it myself, then I'll ask you some questions. <laughs> um, first of all, I mean, why, why am I here today? Well, um, I have to say, Europe's and the United States' processes for setting policies especially in energy efficiency, are really um, looked up to by many countries. So developing countries have um, very urgent needs. They don't have the resources um, to do the kinds of processes that we can do in the US and Europe. So um, everybody's watching what happens here. And they would like to leapfrog. They're very ambitious. They have very pressing needs. And so they look to what is happening here and ask in all our workshops, can we just leapfrog ahead to that? Why don't we do what Europe is doing now rather than go step by step through what everybody else used to do? They want to go straight ahead. So my question is, how can we innovate to overcome some of what I see as worst practices? Okay, They're best practices, but they're worst practices. So um, some of these, and, and this isn't meant as a criticism. It's meant as a, a challenge. Um, that I see are neglecting controls. I, I noticed one of the first slides showed controls as an optional thing to pursue. But controls are the way that we can reduce waste of energy. We can help address peak demand problems. And these are things in the developing world that are very important. Um, a focus solely on efficiency rather than consumption also may not yield some of the results that are needed. Emphasizing components or appliances rather than systems, or focusing on systems rather than enabling platforms, I think holds back innovation. And finally, um, since I work with light bulbs, I have to admit it, emulating old form factors really means that we miss out on great opportunities. So LEDs in light bulb-like shapes are not taking advantage of the full digital features, the um, form factor features, and even some of the other eco-design considerations like materials and end-of-life reduction of material waste. You know, those, those things are lost if we look at old form factors. So um, I put those out as challenges and say that uh, we really welcome everybody's input. And if you would like to do some traveling <laughs> or meet up with people virtually, I can match you up uh, with people in developing countries who would really, really appreciate your wisdom. Thanks. Thank you very much. OK, and uh, we had one. Thanks, Nils. Um, so I, I wanted to just go back to my MEPS-driven innovation comment earlier. Um, I, I think it's highly unlikely that um, anywhere else in the world has the ambitious requirements of circulator pumps uh, that, that we have now in, in Europe. And I don't foresee uh, any takeover of the pumps sector happening, uh, circulator pump sector, uh, from competition. Um, lo looking at distribution transformers, I, I, don't, I don't have the same, the same view. Um, I think that uh, I just attended in, in November the world's first international conference on energy efficient transformers. And it was, it was held in Beijing. 
and um, myself, Cesar Santos Gil uh, from DG Enterprise spoke. I talked about the US, he talked about Europe, and essentially we, um, we talked about the programs that are undergoing. Then every other speaker after us was from China, they were from the steel mills, they were from the transformer manufacturers, they were from the utilities, and it was a complete focus on energy efficiency, on wanting to be the global leaders and the owners of energy efficient transformer technology. They, they are ramping up amorphous steel production in their country. They are uh, going after what's called a delta design for three phase uh, transformers, which is more efficient than what we have here in Europe. Um, my fear, uh, and, and I actually, this is from experience, Robert and I worked together on, on distribution transformers in the US. And um, I remember uh, a company in Canada complaining that Chinese transformer manufacturers were able to bring a low voltage dry type into the Canadian market at a lower price than it cost them to get the raw materials to make the same product. So, so before they even applied their labor to make the product, the product was already cheaper and it had the same efficiency. So, so what I foresee, if, if Europe does not adopt an ambitious requirement on transformers, like they've done on, on heat pump, uh, on uh, circulator pumps, I foresee that um, China will come and will take over and own uh, the transformer business in Europe because they'll be able to deliver more efficient, less expensive models. And we'll see the end of Schneider Electric, we'll see the end of Powell's, we'll see the end of the domestic industry of transformer production because utilities would be stupid not to buy a more efficient, less expensive product uh, for their infrastructure. So I'd, I'd, I think that MEPS can also be seen, it's almost like a protectionist thing, but it's, it's looking to force innovation so that industries, domestic industries, can re remain competitive. And I, I was hoping to, to maybe hear what the panel's reaction to that and if there's some information that we can point to on studies about that. Since we are about to wrap up in a couple of minutes, I would like to see if there's one more question from the floor, and, and then we'll give the, the panelists a possibility to, to react to this. Madara Rambaldi from CSED, Domestic Appliance Manufacturers. I have only two small comments. One is on uh, the presentation or the comments made by Eduard. I think that uh, the fact that uh, mm, Sometimes uh, uh, innovation is brought up at the level of uh, the study already. It's true that I believe that already the fact that the product is already set in the list, also Mr. Bennett met, uh, when is already product mentioned in the priority list, innovation starts already. I think it's an achievement already of the legislation. And already even when the study is prepared and the study is aiming or proposing to ban 50% you know, of the product. And at the, end of the at the end of the day, only maybe 40% are eliminated because the market has moved already. I think it's an achievement of the legislation. So I think we should not regret or we, of not having managed to ban 50% because already the market has incre increased the efficiency. But we should see the fact that the product has been introduced in the priority list as an achievement of the fact that the legislation setting the product in priority list has already driven towards more efficiency rather than being upset that this has not, not happened in the, through the legislation but only through seeing it in the list. And then another comment on the divide and rule idea. I'm not 100% that we should only take the top runner of the companies and talk to him and try to develop legislation with the top runner of the industry. I think that the divide and rule doesn't really work. I think we should try to consider to talk to, of course I represent industry, I represent the trade association, so from my point of view I think it is better to talk to the different uh, stakeholders. Even if we are addressing a specific sector, a specific products, it's better I think to talk to the full sector and to try to get the full sector on board. It might take a month more, but for our sector energy efficiency is important for the whole sector. If we have a divide and rule situation, like for the lot uh, one and two boiler, and you have to divide several sector and speak to all of them and get all together and try to divide and rule, in that situation it took five years. So I think it's try, trying to stick to the same group of people and try to stick to one interface in an interlocutor and not to try to divide and speak only to the best one, 
like it's happened over the past few months where one was trying to be the best one and try to get the commissioner on board, then it becomes more complex. So I would suggest to avoid the divide and rule, at least in most of the cases, if it's possible. Thank you. Uh, Peter Gibson from Intel. Uh, as a global company, I think one of our challenges is, is to try and follow all the uh, energy efficiency regulations and other voluntary initiatives that are ongoing globally. So I, I certainly see uh, the need for, for more convergence, uh, ensuring that uh, we're not just uh, looking at in isolation here in Europe, uh, we're, we're conscious of what's going on elsewhere and equally in those other regions and, and countries they, they do likewise. Uh, I think, you know, as a, as a direct consequence of that is, is that there, there is a, a widespread consultation ongoing uh, and again, uh, when it comes to uh, developing our eco-design uh, regulations, I think you'll f actually find in, in particular product sectors such as the ICT and consumer electronics that there is a great deal of uh, data and knowledge out there that uh, uh, by implication of the fact that there is al already this ongoing activity such as Energy Star and, and other initiatives that actually we are pretty much uh, up to date on, on what's going on. And I'll, I'll maybe just point out something on, on, on what Edward uh, uh, highlighted earlier on there. Uh, he, he had the graphic, uh, graphic uh, cards up there and, and, and demonstrating that there was a difference there. Uh, I would point out that, you know, as part of that ongoing process, Energy Star is actually at this moment in time coming up with uh, a, a version 6 specification which actually addresses computers and, and, and the likes. And I would, I would feel confident that actually, you know, that cons consultation process has been thorough and that uh, as, a, as a result of that, we actually have Energy Star limits that are uh, fit for purpose, i.e. that they're, they're targeting the top 25% of the market. Thank you. Thank you very much. So if we could ha have some final remarks from the panel before we end it all. So should we start with, from this end, Edward, on the four questions or remarks we've had and, and the overall reflections? Yeah, to, to be short in a few sentences, uh, what I would say is uh, there is certainly still a lot of innovation in the products themselves uh, that can make them more efficient, but also outside the products. And uh, for instance, how to make products work better or smarter to reduce the, their use of energy. So it's a matter of uh, controls, for example. So innovation in controls that has been mentioned. Innovation in systems, in system interfaces. Innovation in uh, power management, in communication protocols, and so on, in software. And uh, so there's a lot out there that can be done. And that should also be looked at, I think. OK, thank you. Robert? Um, <clears throat> I think perhaps um, the final questions point out how perhaps there is a need for innovation in how we design policies and how we evaluate policies. And uh, I think. Uh, we live in a very dynamic world and that dynamic world is going to have very strong competitive forces, some of them coming from China, some from the US, some internally within Europe. Um, the, the, the whole learning innovation process uh, helps define a, a mutually beneficial role for both regulation and, and, and market innovation. What, what happens is if the regulators can create the definitions of the top tiers, definitions of the performance, and help harmonize those definitions so that the players can compete on a level, level playing field, then you have the prospect of the uh, many of the top runner players uh, introducing the h most innovative, the highest quality products into the top levels, into those markets where people can recognize the value and, and, and buy those products first. In that process of introducing those new products, 
you as 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 top runner companies with the more reasonable with, with the better sized research and development budgets help create the intellectual property that 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 protect those products as those innovations become uh, adopted into the market uh, there is a need to come to some sort of consensus on expectations to create the stability to create the regulatory predictability that is going to allow people to plan their research budgets, plan their product lines, et cetera. Uh, I, think, I think we mentioned the idea of long-term targets. Um, if, in some sense, perhaps one vision is uh, we, 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 we look at different technologies, we say refrigerators can go 4% per year, TVs can go so many percent per year, we're going to create a ladder of performance levels. Uh, and perhaps we have an expectation that the market's going to move. So you have good definitions, you have expectations, you have a level playing field, you have uh, a, a, a definition of progress that helps accelerate the whole innovation process because the information is transparent and the information is reliable. And I think, um, and then as part of that, I think we have to learn better how to um, monitor the markets, do the market surveillance, so that, so that uh, that information can feed back into refining the definitions, refi making sure that, that everybody's playing by the rules, <coughs> and uh, making basically the efficiency innovation market more efficient in the global economy. Thank you. Michel Young? So I'd, I'd like to thank Robert for his uh, uh, some, some very stimulating ideas, I think, for the Commission and maybe for everyone to, uh, to think about here today regarding market surveillance. Uh, regarding uh, the questions uh, or some of the comments from our colleague in uh, UNEP, um, just a couple of detail points. Uh, material effects, end of life, recycling, etc. Uh, rare earths are increasingly being taken into account with some of the new eco design measures coming through. Uh, and it's very important to influence the developing world in these uh, matters, selfishly from the EU perspective, because they also represent new markets, but also um, because they're going to be increasingly using these. Uh, these um, uh, product groups, and we need to look at uh, developments globally. Thirdly, eco design. Uh, don't don't forget, and I'm sure many people in this room are aware. Eco design isn't only eco design as depicted in the eco design directive. Eco design has gone on both before, and I'm sure it'll go go on way beyond the life of the eco design directive. So there's a lot of good work being done voluntarily by a number of companies, whether they are big or small. And a bit like a small ship, that small ship can sometimes move much faster and change direction a lot quicker than a big ship. Um, we should be ambitious regarding uh, non-EU uh, uh, competitors, and for that reason, that's what we always push within uh, DG Enterprise when we're challenged about competitiveness uh, with our cabinet and hierarchy, uh, or we attempt to, at least. Uh, Long-term targets, I think, I think Edouard has mentioned this and maybe a number of people. So you might see increasingly now with some of the eco-design measures coming through from DG Enterprise and DG Energy, uh, long-term targets, maybe uh, with a reality check uh, revision uh, between Tier 2 and Tier 3. So maybe Tier 3 might be quite ambitious and then there'll be a review before it to met to as a kind of check, is it ambitious enough or has it in, in reality been too ambitious? I think that's maybe a trend you might see uh, with some of the new uh, measures. Thank you. And Hans? Uh, divide and rule. I repeat it. But I could also change the language if uh, figuratively speak uh, is not suitable and I admit it's rough. I could also say follow the star. Uh, because there are always companies and there are always applications that can show that it can be made better. But also remember there are stars on the customer side, the demand, the, those who are buying the equipment, uh, installing it, using it. 
And they are also stars, uh, demanding customers who uh, also are drivers on the market. So those stars should be identified and should be used. And if it so happens that uh, the rest of the companies or the rest of the industry sits down and says, no, let's follow the stars anyway. Uh, so um, identify those who are driving uh, both the, the uh, supply and demand on the market. Uh, then I would like to repeat that for the eco-design, uh, yes, uh, innovation in products might be the, uh, the tool we have here, but also consider the innovation in business models and the, business, uh, and the innovations in organization of the industry, because the market five years ahead will be different from today and must be different from today, and there are also driving forces within that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, Nils. Yes, first of all, I would like uh, to gentlemen in the front. I, I completely agree. That was also my point, that the innovation starts before the adoption date. And it's a good thing that we maybe then uh, accelerate faster in, in, the, in the end date. And to the lady in the back, I, I kind of agree more that uh, we need to look at more than efficiency. That is one of the reasons why we have these large savings for circulators. EI, even though it's called Energy Efficiency Index, is much more. It takes into account uh, not only efficiency of motor and pump, it, it takes into account also its variable speed, how it's controlled, load profile, and everything. This is built into that number, and you can only have a low number which you can place on the market if you fulfill the, the whole. And, and, uh, and what, what we work on now, there's another legislation we haven't talked about in pumps today, is uh, all other uh, what's called water pumps. They can only save three terawatt hours today, looking at efficiency. But uh, when we manage to introduce an EEI for those uh, pumps, we will have uh, at least 10 times uh, greater savings in, in the future for, uh, with an implementing measure taking uh, this into account. So I completely agree. Thank you very much. And I think we will give them a round of applause for this excellent. This eminent panel, and um, before ending, I'd like just to once again thank our sponsors, CLASP, Swedish Energy Agency, and Energifonden. And I also would like to remind you that we are this year from, w, from ES, ECEEE having the, the biannual conference, Rethink, Renew, Restart. And the early bird registration fee is valid until the 8th of February, so you still have a possibility to save 100 euros on, on the registration fee. And it's been a pleasure to, to share this session today, and I would like to thank all the presenters and the panel and, and all you in the audience for the, the questions and for the presenters for being so timely and keeping the time so excellent. And now we have the, the mingle downstairs, and I hope we will continue to discuss all the, the questions we didn't have the time to have during this panel. For instance, how can we increase the integration between research and, and innovations in the companies? How can we take into account the, the users more than we have been discussing today? And there are plenty of questions we still need to discuss. So. Thank you, and there was a final word for me. Yes, uh, Carlos and Peter reminded me. In, we hope that this is the start of a series of seminars. So the next one would be no date yet, etc., but would be one on the extended product approach to discuss products and systems and how they integrate. So that was part of our plan to go towards that. And then a third one might be in on, uh, on uh, <coughs> well, uh, sustainability and, and uh, other, sorry, resource efficiency. resource efficiency, thank you. <laughs> so just keep, keep tuned, stay tuned. Thank you very much, everybody.